righty, let's get started. So welcome everybody to the November 2020 Health Made Simple. Uh, this turned into a, um, I like to bring people in that are experts in their respective fields, people that we personally have had tremendous experience with and have gotten great results with. And we are very blessed that we are in a position that we get to meet some incredible people. And um, you guys all know us as red light therapy people, but of course there is a world beyond lights. And, um, and your health and your animal's health is first and foremost, especially your horses. And so, um, that's why we started doing these. We started doing these uh, during COVID and it's turned into something that I look forward to doing. I'd love to be able to do them once a week, but you know, right now we're doing them once a month. So thank you for joining me today. Um, I have a very special guest today. Um, her name is Rachel Meyer and she lives locally here in Ocala and we happened across Miss Rachel. Um, we were doing a presentation for Karen Rolf's group, and Rachel's part of that group. And she came over and watched us do a presentation on hyoid, I think, or pain hyoid. Okay. And um, and after everything was done and over with, she stuck around. And the particular mare that we were working on, um, she, we were having some pretty significant problems with her, like, and we had used everything in our toolbox that we knew how to do. We had consulted with another veterinarian, a chiropractor, somebody that does um, ozone and chiropractic and um, had another body worker, an orthobionomy person come out and do work on them. And they're all great modalities. And um, through all of this, we just couldn't figure out what in the world was causing this mare to be so incredibly reactive. Um, and we knew that it was something physical because leading up to that, she wasn't that way. And this is a problem that had perplexed us for months. And so incredibly frustrating, incredibly frustrating um, because we couldn't get her the relief that we needed because we just couldn't, we just couldn't figure it out. And so Rachel um, being the kind hearted person that she is, and the very astute horsewoman that she is, um, she was like, well, do you mind if I take a look? And I'm like, have at it, man, because we've tried it. We've tried everything that we can and 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 we're out. We're just out of resources. And um, she pulled. I don't even know if you used your tool, Rachel, um, but she she walked up and literally within three minutes, she identified what was going on with this mare. And then um, we did some work on her. And I believe I had Rachel come back because I don't believe you had your tools with at the time. Mm -hmm. and, and the mare was pretty like, she, you know, she had done a demo and we had been poking and prodding on her. So she was kind of like done with that. Um, and so Rachel came back and literally did one session on her and totally transformed this mare. Um, and so Brian and I, I especially, I was like, okay, yes, ma'am. Who are you and what do you do? And how do I get some of that? Cause that is super cool. And, um, so that's our first introduction to Rachel and uh, since then, we have another mare that's been in training, and Brian has been working on her feet, obviously, with him being an equine podiatrist. And um, this story is really significant on how important body work is and locating trapped fascia and releasing it. Um, the one mare, Sasha, for those of you that know my mares, uh, Sasha has what 
most people would term a clubby foot and it's actually not a club foot. It's called a high low heel where her heels just grow really, really fast. So they look like high heels. Um, and they're little, they're tight little things. Now she's a saddle bred, so she could kind of get away with it and it wasn't causing her any physical issues going on. Um, but Rachel came over and did a body work session on her and um, literally she just did one session on her and by the next, like after the next four week after the trim, um, her foot actually expanded like the, the contraction on her one foot just kind of opened up and that combined with what Brian was doing, like super cool to see and witness firsthand, because that's not something that typically you would be able to um, experience. Or if you had heard the story, you wouldn't necessarily, I wouldn't have believed it if I wouldn't have seen it for my own two eyes. So I would like to introduce you guys to um, a very special person um, Rachel Meyer, she is a tr physical therapist and she's been in the physical therapy industry for a very long time, very long time. She knows the human body like nobody I have ever met. Um, and she also happens to be a horsewoman and she can do amazing things with your horse's body. And it's getting maximum results with, I don't want to say minimal effort, but making something seemingly super complicated and taking it and condensing it down into a system that um, the average person can do. Would that be an accurate statement, Rachel? Yes, very much so. Yay. So welcome. I'm glad you're here today. Thank you. Is there any, Everybody any here today? Is there anything else that I forgot? Because I know that you've got lots of credentials and. Hmm. Well, I do actually also have training in equine body work, in yes. addition to the physical therapy and certifications are you know all the ones that apply to the use of the tools and kinesio tape and all that good stuff that we do on people and have adapted to horses. So. Right. Yeah, I mean, I think you did a, a, a good job in introducing what, oh, good. what we're talking about. Good, good, good. So I'm going to jump right in. And um, so my first question is um, within your specialty, like, and we're going to, I, I guess if we, we, we could talk about horses and if it leads to rider bodies, we can talk about rider bodies as well. Um, but I think we really wanted to focus in on the horses today. Okay. Um, what um, you are a body worker and physical therapist, you're a dressage rider as well. And I know you've done a lot of training in that perspective and the natural um, horsemanship as well why don't why don't you let, let's talk about why don't you explain a little bit about the modality that we're talking about okay that's a good idea the main thing that we wanted to really introduce is the use of the tools and the tools are um basically a, an ex extension of the hand um, and they change your ability to, to have a, a sensation of feedback from the tissue because of the difference between using a metal tool with a, a wide sweep or using a fingertip. It, is, it allows you to cover a lot more ground at once. And when you're assessing tissue, what you're really assessing is what's different from one area to the next. Right. So you're able to detect these differences a lot more easily and a lot faster when you don't have such a relatively small surface as your fingertip and you don't have the compressive factor that you're, you, you have 
a certain amount of loss of accuracy because your fingertip squishes and the tool doesn't. Right. So that's, I think that's the most important thing to understand about why the tools are so valuable from an assessment standpoint. Right. So what we're talking about, so what Rachel specializes in um, is some, one of, one of her specialties, cause she has many, um, the one we're talking about today is called instrument assisted soft tissue mobilization. And go oh, Donna. I know. Right. And um, it's just a really big, big word for uh, using a tool. Rachel's talked about a tool. Um, she prefers the metal ones um, for scanning she part of part of her protocol and part of what she does is she does a scan now i know a lot of you are familiar with what we do at photonic health with doing assessments and um and we're we're very uh in depth and in detail but we're kind of looking at it from a uh tcm perspective and a, just a little bit differently and um Rachel's, the tools that she uses, um, literally on my mare, Sasha, she was working on her and she found several spots that when you went and scanned it with your hands and your fingers, you could not feel it. You could not find it. And Rachel's been coaching Brian and I in how to use these things. And it's, act, it's unbelievable what you find and it's typically the smallest little thing. It's like the piece of sand in your shoe that you can't get out or that, you know, is in there and it's driving you crazy and yet you, you can't find it. That is what this tool, that's how I would describe it. Would that be pretty accurate? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's basically a way of detecting asymmetries or loss of mobility or um, loss of glide and sometimes pain points where you see a reaction where you didn't expect it or you didn't get that same reaction when you just ran your finger over something. It's feedback. It's also um, the tissue quality where you'll feel uh, something that is just not normal. And if you scan a few horses or a few people or even yourself, you very quickly feel those differences because it amplifies everything for you. You don't have to be so, um, I mean, it helps to be intuitive. It helps to have a good sense of touch. It helps to be already a body worker. But if you're not, this is a good way to get your hands on and start to feel with a little bit of, it's almost like amplification yeah. of what's under there, under the hide or in the hide. Yeah. So it's, it, I know when I started, I used to think, oh, you know, I have good hands. I have really good palpation skills. I can really feel stuff and treat stuff out. And I took pride in that. And when I got the tools, boy, was I humbled. <laughs> it was like, <laughs> oh my gosh, you could miss so much and also just be spending hours. You'd probably spend 15 minutes to every minute that you spend in assessment. Right. With the tool. Right. So, and that's across the board. That's animals. That's people. Yeah. It's dogs. It's anybody. Yeah. And treatment also just it, the treatment goes very rapidly because the actual mechanics of the tool have to do with simulating nerves within the tissue. So you don't have to really do all that much to get a response and you get a response really quickly because it, uh, it's based in a neural response. So you don't have to think about, Oh, I've got to break up all this adhesion or, Oh, this trigger point is so big and old and nasty. 
you can get a lot more done with ease and without being aggressive and without heavy, heavy pressure. Right. So you don't have to be like one of those intense body worker, you know, warriors. <laughs> Correct. And, and, you know, that's one of the things that I, we absolutely loved about it was that, cause you know, we're about being as non-invasive as possible and getting a lot of results done with, you know, like, being more efficient, let's say, let's put it that way. We just want to be super efficient and it doesn't have to be painful. Um, And so that's one of the things that we absolutely love about the tool. Um, And so my um, way of describing it is we're doing a form of, do we, do you, would you say fascial release or just tissue release? Because like, would you, would we click go in more one bucket than the other? No, I think you're, you're pretty much hitting all the, all the types of soft tissue. You're hitting connective tissue. You're hitting contractile based muscles. You're hitting the connections between the muscles and, and the bone, which are tendons. And you're also hitting ligaments. You're, t- you're touching on all of these connective or non, um, non-contractile, like I said, non-contractile and contractile tissue. And even in some areas where there's a, a bony prominence, if you work very carefully, uh, you're, you're really getting right into that tissue where it connects into the bone. So calling it one thing or another, there is a technique that's known as myofascial release and it is named that and there is a systematic approach that's used. So to, to take that title and call it myofascial release might be misleading to some people who are familiar with that as a thing. Okay. But yes, it, it, it is a type of, but it it, right it's a it's a it's a just another way of getting getting there right yeah so not only is the tool um great for scanning and detecting stuff but it is also really great for doing body work essentially now do you have your tool with you i do can you pull it out while you're pulling out rachel Uh Uh-oh. So, um, in my photonic health bag, (laughs) I know. So, uh, Rachel, are you familiar with the fascial blaster? Yes. Remember you taught me, you told me about it. (laughs) Well, um, I know that some of you, you probably, a lot of you have seen it or heard of it and it's, it was pretty popular a couple of years ago. Um, and it was geared towards humans. And, but what they would do is you would just, you know, like rub this tool on you and um, do it so intently that a lot of times it would leave bruising, which seemed to be pretty counterintuitive for me, because if we're wanting to have health and vitality, um, anytime you create bruising um, to me is a type of tissue damage. And you so know I want to address that. Yes. So why don't you, can you just show us your tool? Show us the tool. Okay. So I have three tools with me. Okay. Okay. The one I use a real lot, particularly is the edge tool because it's the most versatile and it's the easiest to use. Um, and also because it has a really, really perfect beveled edge that I find uh, is the easiest to to get the right kind of pressure on the tissue. So that's the edge tool. It has different contours so that when you use it, you can contour to the particular body area without having to change tools, which is really, really helpful when you're working on horses. When you're working on people, generally you could have a table next to you and you could just switch tools. And so you might have more tendency to use more than one. This tool is called 
what is this swoop called? Blade? <laughs> no, it is the Swede. This tool, tool is from a different company. And it is really, really nice for scanning horses because of its size. It's also very good for hamstrings on humans and buttocks and things like that, where you have big areas of tissue, but it is much more difficult to use. It's not as easy to grasp, but I do use it a lot. Um, I'm at that level where I can use a tool that's a little harder to use. And this is the little edge tool. This is called the Edge Mobility Star. And I use this on little tiny when I'm trying to navigate around bony prominences, let's say on a hawk or on somebody's elbow, things like that. So, but again, it doesn't have that really perfect edge that the edge, the one that's called the edge tool has. So I tend to gravitate towards the edge just because I like its tissue contact the best. So that being said, there are a lot of tools out there. There are a lot of brands out there. There are a lot of opportunities for certification from people who sell tools. So they sell them, they manufacture them, and some people sell them, but they don't have a set of tools. So some of these more established companies that started out early on started uh, with a, a system of treatment that they would train you in and then you would have to buy their tools because they trained you with their tools. And in the early days, when I first started hearing about this type of treatment, it was all about this one group. And I began to start to see the pros and cons. And the pros were that many patients were thrilled after their treatment. They just, they got changes they'd never gotten before. They got improvements. They got rapid relief of their pain. But I started to see people after they had had these treatments. And you can see if you can even go online and look, there are photos posted of people with these massive amounts of bruises and tissue that just looked like, I mean, I always thought if I ever did that to a patient, I'd be sued. They looked terrible. And over the years, I thought, well, maybe a horse could handle that better than a human. And that's what kind of got me into thinking about using these tools on horses because their hides are so much less fragile than a human person's skin. So that's kind of what pushed me into thinking about it. But then as it turns out, over the course of the time that I began to study this, we begin to find out you don't have to do that to get the results. Right. Right. You don't need any of that bruising. In fact, it creates inflammation that you don't need. It, it, it kind of equates to the counter irritant type treatments. Like in the old days, used to blister a lot of horses. They used to do um, a lot of treatments based on stimulating the area to try to get it to refresh the healing process. But as it turns out that you can do that by just stimulating the nerves that are embedded in the tissue, of which there are specific types, and not to get too technical, but there are nerves in your muscles and in your connective tissue that tell the body where it is. Right. And when you have an injury, a lot of times those nerves say, don't move. There's pain here, there's an injury here. So sometimes you have to go back over those nerves and say, calm down, it's all good. <laughs> so the tools really shine when you take that approach. That's awesome. Um, yay. Um, one of the things, so as a professional, what question do you find yourself answering the most? Hmm. from your clients regarding horses? Um, well, a lot of them are related to movement. Um, a lot of people question what they can do to improve the horse's motion 
or if there is anything they can do to, to improve the horse's motion or to relax certain parts of their body, such as releasing the pole or relaxing the top line, engaging the abdominals. So basically the, the question is, can you do anything that will improve my horse's athletic performance or posture or right i think that's probably the most the, the um, most that you get yeah. yeah well and we live in a we both live in ocala right so we're dealing you know we've got the high performance horses all around us so that's really right. you know a lot of what we see in our everyday occurrences especially you um so um, we actually have a couple of questions that have already come in. And so I think they would, and they actually would be really good. So um, Brenda asks, does it work on swelling? Her, her colt was gelded and his sheath has swollen and they are having a difficult time getting the edema to reduce there would and then she says would there be related areas in his body that could be worked on to help with the edema and then um points that we would suggest from a photonic light perspective so um it's kind of like part question for me and part question for you so um from our perspective uh, we would use the lights um, if if the colt would let you put the light on the scar directly to do that. Um, and then we would also, because of the swelling involved, we would do the rear fascial release, um, which is part of the body balance protocol. And the reason that we would put lights on it is because uh, lights work so well to remove the edema and to induce the phagocytosis process. So phagocytosis is the cells process that goes in and eats up all of the extra debris that's not supposed to be there and moves it to moves it out of the body. So that's how we would address it from a light therapy perspective. But I'm not sure like what would you do like from a tool perspective, Rachel? Can it be used on edema or is it Kind it, of if you, it, it, it can be used on edema, but you have to be exceedingly light touch. And you basically, with any edema, the reason it's there is because it's, the, it's where the fluid went that gravity could affect. In other words, if the horse was able to lie down on his back and put his legs up in the air, like a human would, you know, to, to reduce swelling, it would go down. But the other thing that reduces swelling is gentle massage. And you can use the tool in that way. Very, very gentle, just to stimulate the lymphatics in the opposite direction of gravity. If the, if the colt is, I mean, he may not want to be touched, right? That sheath area, you don't want to get hurt. Um, right. But if he's real touchy feely and he's comfortable with you doing that, then yes, you could. Um, you could also work on the legs, the hind legs with the larger circulatory arteries and veins that are on the inside of their inner, inner uh, hind legs. And just again, gently against gravity. Um, just to take some long strokes with the tool all the way up because the, the best thing for him really is mobility, move around and, you know, get that, that blood circulating and get the lymphatics to move. So yes, you can do something. The light is probably easier with a young horse. Um, but if he's, amenable to being touched and worked on it, it, it can't it's not a bad idea but it wouldn't be the first thing that I would do if I'd never used a tool before right correct yeah I I should I should say that um 
you know, we got, I ordered my tools right away. Um, as soon as Rachel was like, yes, I'll show you how to use them. And I was so excited. And then she gave us a, okay, you've got to go practice on yourself because when you go to do it on your horses is vastly different. And so there was definitely a learning curve because you are using a metal object. You know, if you bump into a bone, fortunately I have pretty, um, some of my horses are pretty tolerant. And you know, there was a couple times that I accidentally bumped into one of their bones and they like, they kind of like, they didn't jump, but they're like, hey. Um, so definitely it's one of those things like, you know, don't go out and practice this on, you know, your most difficult horse or the one that's got ulcers and can't stand to be touched because you're going to end up, you know, not Im improving your relationship with your horse, which is ultimately what you're wanting to do anyways. Yeah. Um, we, we do want to offer training rather than just tell you to go buy a tool and play. Right, exactly. So Brenda, if you do have a light, if you do have a, a red light, um, definitely do the rear fascial release and you can put it right on that sheath or you can go all the way around the area. I know that we've got several clients that have um, gotten swollen sheaths to go completely away. So by, by just using red lights. So if he'll let you do that, um, then, you know, give that a go. So um, Judy has another question and this really kind of segues into a little bit more about the fascia and muscles and regeneration. So I'm going to go ahead and um, she says, Judy says, I have a horse with a large open wound where the tissue was uh, scooped out. Um, it is healing by filling in from the inside out and the edges in. Will the fascia under and over the muscle regenerate? And how can I treat the wound to minimize adhesions and scarring? Now, Judy, this comes from one of our top students. So she is treating it with the uh, multi-light. The red, she started with the red light and then the multi-light. So she is, the horse is getting blue, green, and red on it from a light perspective, but from a tool perspective, let's talk about um, scarring because that's the biggest thing. Like once, can she, can, can you use the tool on an open wound? No. Okay, that's what I thought. I wouldn't do that. Okay. I, I wouldn't, I would, I would wait a good long time. As you know, when we, we looked at your mare that had had the, a, a, what sounds like a similar wound, right. um, we had to wait a long time and we st we did see a change when we worked on her but we also hit a piece of tissue that wasn't strong enough to withstand that kind of yeah treatment and and it did break the skin a little bit so you when that wound heals you want to work around the most um, adjacent tissue that you can get to without getting into skin that's really not right. fully resolved because scar tissue can take up to a year to to regenerate and reform itself over and over and over until it organizes into something that's strong enough to withstand that kind of motion um, that is normal. So depending on where the injury is, it may take a long time before you can release all that tissue that's underneath. So the fascia, it will all heal and it will heal with adhesion without a doubt, but you, you want to be incremental about mobilizing that tissue because if you op keep opening and opening it up repeatedly, you could end up with a chronic infection. And of course, we're horse people and we want it healed yesterday, right? And we want it to move perfectly. And, and we want it to move perfectly and we don't want a scar there. But reality states sometimes that we just do have scarring. And um, so, from a, so I'd like to talk about the scar tissue. So 
it's one of my favorite topics because especially when we go work on horses, you know, and we'll go, oh, well, when did this, when, what happened here? Where, where did the horse get the scar from? Oh, you know, that's nothing that happened a long time ago. And that has nothing to do with, you know, what's going on right now. And I'll literally just put a light on it and the horse gives me giant releases. And so I really like to, um, you know, the importance of giving the scar tissue the time to heal, like to regenerate, to heal, but then also getting it to its optimal state, because that is one of the things that we've seen. Um, we have one of our team members had a scar on her arm and you know, we've tried everything we could with it. Of course, red light, red light, red light. And then we got these cool tools. And so Brian got super excited and, you know, we worked on her with the tool and um, there was a huge change. And so can you talk a little bit more about scar tissue and that sure. none, like I'll, what your philosophy is on it? I'll give you a, uh, a human example that can be pretty dramatic and it's far afield from the horse, but it's very apropos. I have many times treated patients who, with hip replacements. So hip replacements are unbelievably common in our society now. And most people don't get a real lot of therapy after a hip replacement because they function really well once they get out of their rehab settings and they go home and they, they do really great. But every once in a while, you would get a patient in whose scar hadn't been addressed. They'd come in and they'd say, oh, you know, my, my pain is not the pain that I used to have, but it hurts there's something wrong. And the doctor says there's nothing wrong, but sent me to therapy anyway. They, they x-rayed it. They looked at it. The, nothing wrong with the prosthesis, nothing wrong with anything. Well, you get this patient in and you examine them and they have this huge, nasty scar that looks like they were bull whipped. And it's lumpy because the, the way they close those incisions is they put they make a tent out of the tissue. They put, they put a, a layer of stitches underneath and then they close it either with additional stitches or staples. And what's supposed to happen is that puckered area, the, the stitches underneath are supposed to break, eventually break down and then let the scar flatten. So a lot of times they either, some of them don't break or they break unevenly and they make a mountain range along the person's hip it's very uncomfortable. It doesn't glide with the rest of the tissue. Suddenly they have a joint that works, but it doesn't work. So you go in there with the tool two or three times. And a lot of times you, you get this pop, 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 pop as you're running the tool down and those underneath stitches break that are mm. supposed to have been broken six months or two a year ago. And all of a sudden the scar just goes whew, and flattens and the person feels a tremendous difference. So the good news is you can make a difference later on. The bad news is that really should have been addressed by a therapist at the end of their rehab when their skin was healed and they were fully right. ready to be treated. But then the question is, how do you know when it's ready? Right. So it's it's ready when it's starting to shrink. It's ready when it's no longer showing any shininess or fluid underneath. Um, it's generally ready within six months to a year, unless it was a tremendously slow healing wound, which many horses get. Uh, I've had a wound that took seven months to close on one of my horses years ago. And that tissue was never strong enough to really withstand a lot of, of uh, abrading or anything like that.
So you, you really have to use your judgment and you have to do it case by case. You can't really give a formula for that. But yeah. scar tissue in general, the response to the light combined with um, tissue mobilization is, is pretty amazing. Yes. So. Yeah. Yes. Well, in our team member that had the scar, like she had been there on her arm for a couple of years and it was like a reddish purple and it had healed over, but she really not, you know, like, but it was like a reddish purple and it didn't really bother her, but it was raised. It kind of looked like a keloid scar, but it really kind of wasn't. And, um, and I know that we kind of went over it with the tool and then she did some more tool work on it and it actually came up to the surface and um, she had like some fluid come out, um, which was kind of bizarre, but then it, but then it flattened out and it um, completely changed color. So it's more white. Is that pretty, like, is that what people should be looking for? Like, well, scar, uh, scar changes color as it resolves. That's one thing that is part of the deal. Um, it goes from red to white usually. Um, but the, the thing that's interesting to me is the, is the fluid motion. Like a lot of times somebody will say, uh, what was that? <laughs> you know, right. like something changes in tissue and, you know, a, a lot of times when you get a big change and you say, well, no, we don't think that this tool is actually capable of breaking an adhesion in tissue. And then yet you get this dramatic change. My general sense is that what we've done is move fluid, that you might open up a pocket of fluid in a, a, a group of an area of soft tissue, or there may be swelling that's trapped in there and you never knew it. And what happens when fluid sits in the body and it doesn't get moved out is proteins form in it and it gets hard. It forms what we call brawny edema if it's a, a big fat limb or something like that. And that those proteins make it much harder to mobilize that fluid. So if you see something swollen, that's why you always want to get it to come down as quickly as you can because you don't want that to gain permanence by having too much of those proteins form in there. So one good thing is to take the light or the, the tool and start to try to get it moving. But a lot of times, like I said, I'll find something old and it's almost like you popped up a little balloon in there and it'll just be gone, you know, it's right. That's kind of dramatic and fun, but. I know, I know. Yes. And it was interesting when you worked on Bella's scar. So, um, and it continues and that scar is four years old. So, um, that's the one where my, I think most of you have seen it. Um, my mare got caught on a leg bolt and then, um, went backwards and just like put a giant gash in her shoulder. And like, I'm talking a giant gash, like, three inches deep and it ripped. So it wasn't a clean one. And so it ended up being three inches deep and probably about four to five inches long. So it was um, very traumatic. Um, and we had lights on her immediately and it healed up, like it closed up within a month, which was pretty miraculous considering the injury. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, it's still scar tissue. And so, uh, and we continue working on it. And so um, it's amazing how the tool has caused some change, some additional changes in it for the good. Like, you know, that's, it's right at the bottom of the brachiocephalic muscle. And that's such a important muscle for them for proper movement um, that, you know, you gotta, you gotta stay on top of the scars. So and even also, though like, sorry to interrupt you, but just, just to make a point that you really should look at when you, when you say it's right at the bottom of the brachiocephalus, that means that you really want to look at the entire muscle and 
compare it to the one on the other side and see, is it, is that scar tissue affecting it even pretty remotely from the actual thing that you see with your eye or feel with your hand that when you run the, the tool down that muscle, it's really going to give you an idea of where the problem really lives. Right. Which may not be exactly on that little crater on the horse's neck that she has. Right. Yeah. That was, you know, that was one of the biggest things to me when we started using the tool. Um, and because you had us do it in different directions, that, that was the, that was the biggest aha for me because one way it would feel great. And then the next way it'd be like, it felt like completely different tissue. So that was really fascinating to me like that going over the same tissue could feel different going different ways. Right. Um, Which is, again, it's one of those things that's sort of so eye opening about using the tool because those differences are much harder to detect by hand. Oh, ab absolutely. So, absolutely. You know, you, you have so much more opportunity for change when you can detect these things so much more accurately and with so much more ease. And Correct. I think much more comfortable for horses to be addressed that way because there's, there's something about spreading your touch that is much more comforting right. than being poked and prodded at. Correct. Um, and sometimes you need to do that because you're looking at points Right. But when you're scanning, you can still pick up a lot of those points, but, but it's not as noxious. The stimulus is not as noxious, which, you know, I mean, that can make it harder to find what's bothering them because they're not, may not be that reaction, but maybe you don't need that reaction to find what you're looking for. Correct. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. So Kelly has a question. Um, she says, I have a six-year-old Arab saddlebred mare. Good luck, yay. Good, you're, you're a brave girl, Kelly. Um, I've got two saddlebreds, and I've also had Arabs. So they're, they're fun breeds, the combination together. <laughs> um, she's extremely tight in her hind legs. We've been told she has a structural issue in her pelvis which causes her to not be able to engage as easily. She pretty much refuses to stretch her back leg, even for the farrier. We just talked about this yesterday, Rachel. And she has had fascial work done, but finds it very painful. I'm interested in your comment about the nerve releases and wondering if this would be better. She's also very tight on her right shoulder, makes sense, even refusing to stand with it even. She consistent, consistently keeps her left leg forward for comfort. Comfort. What are your thoughts? Uh, I have a couple of thoughts. I'd like to know more about what you mean when you say tight. In other words, if she's tight in the hind legs, is she not swinging her legs forward or is she not willing to bring them back when you ask her to lift her feet? Um, how comfortable are her feet? Um, what else would I want to know? Um, what kind of work does she do? Do you have a saddle fitted to her? So I have a lot of questions, which is what happens when I go to work on a horse. I ask a lot of questions and I like to listen to whatever the owner or trainer has noticed or dealt with over time. And then I'd like to watch the horse move. So I would be curious to see the horse, maybe a little video or something. But if you could answer those questions, then it would be easier for me to comment on what would work for her. But I think in general, the things you're describing, I would almost bet money that the, using the tool would be helpful in finding exactly where this horse is having an issue. Yes. Um, and, I, and I do think it, it, that the question was, would she tolerate it better? Most likely she would. And, you know, I think Donna's horse that we kind of 
ended up bonding over um, is a great example of that because she was exceedingly intolerant of touch. Just, just couldn't wait to get away from everybody. Just don't yeah. bother me. And yeah. Which happens to be a saddlebred as well. Um, <laughs> um, and my question on it, like there are a couple um, red flags for me. Um, you, uh, Kelly, you state you've been told she has a structural issue in the pelvis. And so what exactly is that structural issue? And I mean, if it's not a broken bone or a deformed bone or a fractured bone, then everything basically is held together by soft tissue. So if you address the soft tissue, then it, for me, like this is just my view on it is, is if you address the soft tissue, then you can change the structural. Um, yeah. And um, correct, would you? Would that be a fair statement, Rachel? Well, the, the pelvis is not a particularly mobile area in terms of the parts that put it together, but it is attached to the spine. It is attached to the hind legs. And so it, it works as a unit, but a structural problem with it is a rather vague description. And there is a difference in some Arabs um, in their spine. Uh, so that, that if you look at, if, if somebody looks at that horse and sees that it looks a little different than other horses, they may just be looking at an Arab spine, um, which is shorter than yeah. other breeds. So, and so the angle of the pelvis, the question is, is, is the angle of the pelvis that looks quote unquote abnormal or, you know, has something unusual about it. Is it the way that the horse carries it? Is it the angle of the pelvis or is it the structure of the pelvis? So it would be interesting to try to tweak out. Right the the answer to that question and then the way to tweak it out is to work on it yeah um, yeah and she says that the horse is not willing to put her feet back like when the farrier goes to pull the feet back so um, and the fright front right foot is a club and an irregular small hoof so they're working with the farrier but of course brian is in my ear and um so from a club perspective is it a true club foot have you gotten have you gotten x-ray uh, x-rays confirming that the coffin bone is actually deformed or is it just a high low heel syndrome where the horse is just growing heel really really fat like faster than the other foot um so so oh, there's lots there's lots a lot and that there. that will happen when the horse is not bearing weight normally over that foot because of something that's shifting the weight right abnormally. So if the horse is really, really tight in the hip flexors, it's going to change the angle of the pelvis, just like in a human. Yeah. Um, and so the horse will have trouble releasing because that, pelvis doesn't have anywhere to go and the, the muscle is shortened. Yeah. The hip, the hip flexor muscle shortened. So it, it makes it hard to bring the leg back. Right. Um, so yeah, something that'd be very interesting horse to work on. Yeah. Tools and, and try to release some Rachel of that. Rachel was just out yesterday and she worked on, I've got a 24 year old, uh, Felver and mare and she's a big girl. She's a light draft and, is interesting um, because, you know, Rachel was working on her back legs in an area that normally I would never see a body worker work. Um, but she had scanned this area and as she scanned it, she felt something apparently because she looked up at me and she says, does this horse not like to pick up her back feet? <laughs> and I was like, well, how did you know that? And then she proceeded to, you know, do some work on those back legs and the mare had giant releases and lo and behold this morning I looked out this morning and she was just she was like I even said to Brian like look at how square she's standing like 
And, and then um, she got ridden this afternoon and she was just a rock star. So, um, so that's the cool thing that I really like about Rachel, the work that you do and your tool and the tool and using the tools is because you get to really hone in and it's just like sticking a magnifying glass on it where even your hands can't feel it, um, oh. which is just mind blowing just mind-blowing to me um so um it was it it's, it continues to be mind-blowing for me as well and like I said just the, all those years that I didn't have them it's like oh my gosh right all those, all those treatments all those things I did that I thought were really great they right. were okay <laughs> but right. way better exactly we've yeah. got I can't believe an hour's almost an hour's gone by we've really? got I know, um, but that's, that's what happens, right? You and I get together and we just chat and it's yep. great. Um, Lorraine has a question. She says, I've been massaging a rescue horse since January with a severely atrophied shoulder. They're actually planning to put him down before it gets really rainy and wet this winter simply because he's still very unstable on that leg. I don't think that it's the brachiocephalic. I think it's the muscle that wraps around the shoulder joint on the inside that's weak and unstable. Can this tool help to strengthen it in this area? The area, the farrier cannot trim him because the right shoulder wants to dislocate and he'll collapse or almost collapse if the farrier tries to trim the left front. It sounds like there may be some nerve damage in there and it can take quite a long time for that to improve, but it can improve. And without giving the horse a year, you won't know the answer to that. So, um, my feeling is I would go ahead and treat. I would go ahead and try using the tools on the areas adjacent to the scapula and gently get in around the scapula as well as the muscles in the neck. Um, I would try putting the horse's foot onto um, some padding and try to practice getting get the horse to try to weight bear into it. Um, even there's a technique, it's kind of a funny technique. It's easy, much, much easier to do on a dog, but it's called false floor. And you take, you could take a board and put the board under the horse's foot and just get, try to get the horse to press into the board. Um, so you just try to do a weight shift so that the, the, the board is on a, a pad of some kind that's squishable, like a cushion. So you need a cushion and the board and then the foot goes on top of that and then just, just get them to like shift over onto it just to put the foot down just so that it starts to stimulate the, the proprioception in that limb. Um, and that's, that's what I would attempt uh, to rehab that but yes I would definitely try to use the tools awesome and but, I don't know Lorraine if you're using lights but I would from a light therapy perspective I would also uh illuminate be illuminating that shoulder on a regular basis but I would also be addressing the opposite side yeah that that's my um so um Wow, you guys. Um, so Rachel, do you remember the name of the company that carry the, well, the Swede tool? Do you, do you remember? Yeah. Yeah, that's um, Virtig. It's, ah, <laughs> perfect. What? I'll spell it for everybody. It's V-E-R-K-T-Y-G. Now, um, the next biggest question is, where can people go learn about this and how can they train on it? I know that there's a lot of resources for people. So there, you know, there, there's that. That's already out there. But 
I think you're the only one that's, are you the only one doing it on horses? Um, well, I think I'm the only one with as comprehensive a plan. Um, we do have, as you know, um, a book coming out. Yay. Hopefully sooner than later. Yes. Um, so there's, there's going to be that resource and hopefully courses as well. Um, I do know that there are some other resources that I, I think have limited, um, you know, they basically show you how to use a tool and, right. you know, I don't, I don't particularly like the tool they use. Um, I don't particularly want to say their name. <laughs> we don't need to, we don't need um, to. But because I've seen some uh, some pretty weak presentations from that group, um, I don't know of anybody doing it in the way that we do it. Uh, that, that you know that that's got a comprehensive resource that is going to address the whole horse and be something that someone could actually learn the techniques from. Right. So stand by, stand, Keep, stand by. So in touch um, with Donna and uh, yes. So we'll. um, as a, so Rachel has a book written, um, and we just completed our horse book. So you guys, thank you for bearing with us. Um, the reason there was a bit of a delay was because we ended up releasing our multi light and that has three colors in it. And we figured that you guys would get mad at us if we didn't put the horse book with the three color protocols in there. So we added extra work to our own plate, um, but we did it so that you guys, you know, to give you guys the best that you can get. Um, and so Rachel's been very patient um, because now her book is on my plate to look at, to review, because we do want to release it out um, to you guys and out to the horse world because what she is doing and how she's developed this, um, it really is transformational, like com really super cool stuff. And um, she's also going to be offering um, some workshops, training dates, yes, absolutely, and some webinars. We, um, as that information, as we get all of that out there, we will uh, be happy to share that information with you guys. Um, we just had wanted to give you guys a heads up. And of course, Rachel is available via email. Um, you can also, she can also do um, Zoom consultations as well. So, and whether it's for people or for horses, she can consult on both. Um, she does amazing work. I actually had my brother uh, who's had chronic back problems come down from Wisconsin and work with her for a week. And a week's not a long time to undo 50 some years of structural postural ick um, but she made a huge difference and, you know, Brian and I have been going to her on a regular basis and she's made changes in my body that nobody else has ever touched and, um, and riding is so much easier. <laughs> okay. Like it's not work. <laughs> so I, that I thank you for that. I thank you. Welcome. So, um, any parting thoughts, Rachel? Hmm. Well, it's, it's been a great pleasure to introduce this to all of you. And it's been a great pleasure to work with you, Donna. Um, I think it's an exciting time and people are really, really trying to learn how to help their horses in a way that we haven't done before. And the connections are so much more intimate. So I think the, the excitement about a different way to address the way your horse feels and have feedback from the horse's body uh, is, is really exciting. And I think people are going to be thrilled. Yeah. So um, I can't yeah. wait to get it out there to a large, large group. 
Yes, let's get this COVID out of here so we can get back to doing yeah. super cool, fun stuff and and uh, helping make the world a better place for uh, horses and more pain free. So, thank you so much for being on here, and um, thank you all for joining me today. I it's never enough time. You guys know I could talk forever in a day. And uh, you will be seeing more from Miss Rachel, so stay tuned. Um, we've got some good stuff planned for you guys. And like Rachel had said, it, the, the lights work great, the tools work great. And when you combine the two together, they just are like, get some amazing work done. So thank you guys for joining us. Um, Happy Thanksgiving. We are so grateful to have you guys as part of the Photonic Health group and part of our family. And um, we want you all to be healthy first and foremost and stay safe and um, go out and give your horse a big giant hug for us. And we'll see you guys soon. Thank you. Thank you. Please email me with your feedback. Yes. <laughs>